Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the Texas USA 2013 series, and it is a question and answer session with Rachel, Mary's guide, and audience. Presented by Rachel, Mary, and Jesus on the 15th of November 2013 in Austin, Texas, USA. This is session seven. All right, what we're going to do today is probably do some channeling. And at this stage, Mary's guide, Rachel, is going to firstly come in and have a chat with you. But uh, she might have a chat with me rather than you, just so that Mary can feel... She's a bit, Mary's a bit nervous today. It's been a while since we've done a bit of channeling, hasn't it, Rachel? Mm -hmm. And if we could have all mobile phones off, all electronic stuff off, that would be fantastic. Because um, otherwise it's very interrupting for Mary's concentration. Um, and then uh, we think we'll probably be able to do a bit of channeling of some other spirits who might be around as well after that. So it's usually easier. That must be someone's phone or something that's doing all that. Um, it's usually a bit easier for Mary to channel darker spirits than it is to channel the, uh, our guide. So what we'll do is we'll channel the guide first, Mary's guide, Rachel, first, and then see what happens after that. You never know what Rachel might have in store for you or Mary. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and... Um, and then, as I said, we might get to channel some darker spirits uh, who have been... There's a constant stream of spirits who w want to channel to us, so they might not be darker spirits, they might just be spirits in any of the spheres below the sixth. Um, so we'll see what happens. Hello everyone. I'm Rachel and I'm here with my beloved soulmate, Timothy. We are very pleased for this opportunity to speak with you all this afternoon. We have observed with much interest your gathering and there are a few issues we would like to cover with with all of you if you are open to receiving some some feedback and some guidance perhaps as you prepare to leave in the coming days and go back to your regular lives. So would you like to hear from us? Yes. <laughs> Desire is a wonderful thing and here we are not backwards in expressing it in every way that we are able. Um, this is perhaps an important first message that we would like to share with each of you as you return to your regular day today. And that is to not neglect desire. You have had the benefit of much wisdom and counsel over the previous week, the week that has just passed some of you individually, and then also as a larger collective group. Now, the ball is in your court, as you would say, to engage this process and to bring about change in your lives. It will be necessary to engage your will, as our brother Yeshua often calls it. But even more than this will, to observe the numerous decisions that you make on a daily basis and recognize these as expressions of your will. Begin to become sensitive to just how quickly you may change your life in terms of the positive or the negative. And by this we mean throughout the course of every day you make many, many emotional decisions. If you choose humility, even in the moment when it seems the most difficult thing, 
This is often the times when we are able to guide you the most and for you to be able to grow closer to our Father. So this is the first part of the message we wish to impart, and that is to strengthen your desire and observe your decisions, because your, deci- your decisions are, in fact, a product of your, des- your true desires. So if you find yourself continually choosing to avoid, recognize that your desire is not yet strong to feel. It is true that all of you live your lives surrounded by many addictions and the avenues through which to gratify those addictions. And this is why perhaps you will have to be especially aware of strengthening your will in the direction of more positive, more loving and more humble choices. Many of you do not experience or understand yet the beauty of a desire that is fully felt and embodied in your life, especially those in harmony with love. But many of you also avoid this process of... Sorry, just a moment. As always with mediumship, this is not a simple process of delivering a message as clearly as we would wish. (laughs) There is always the medium to contend with. But we love our sister and we thank her for this gift of service. So if we may continue. We wish to expound more on this issue of desire. Many of you fear desire. You fear becoming sensitive to how it is you are expressing your will. And it is this point which we wish to make very clearly. If you are to change in this coming year, as we, so, we were so interested to uh, partake in this discussion last evening when many of you were discussing where would we be in a year, how will we have changed in a year? If you are to change and grow in this coming year, to grow in love and to grow your joy, it will be necessary for you initially to simply become sensitive to the issue of desire within your lives. Many of you are are ashamed of your current desires and this makes you wish to stifle them. Others of you simply fear the experience of any desire because you fear how others in your life will react to these things. You fear being called selfish, being accused of not being loving. And so those of you who have these injuries simply squash your desires almost completely. Or if you are to take an action or make a decision to use this beautiful gift of your will, you are always first analysing how will others perceive this before you act. In doing this, you are not fully experiencing the strength of your desire, the power of your will. And this is the lesson with which we wish to impart to you, that it is important to become sensitive to your desires and how you wish to use your will, even if initially you wish to use your will in a direction which you can now see is not loving. We are saying to you that it is important that you get in connection with these these desires within you, to really feel them as emotions and to feel the strength of how much you wish to do these things, the strength of your will used in the direction that it is currently used in. 
This is very important because it will help you connect to the emotions surrounding the decisions that you are making, the way in which you are using your will. Will become, the reasons why you are using your will in this way will become very clear when you are able to connect to the feeling of how much you want certain things. Then temptation for many of you is to leave and to decide, I am now going to want different things. I will want the loving things and the humble things and I will do the good things and the best things and I will simply change my will. But as we so often uh, share with this brother and sister who are in front of you, this is not merely a simple decision. You must first connect to the emotions which drive your decisions and your will and fully experience those things. So rather, to, rather than to squash your will, to squash the feelings that drive your decisions and your desires, it is to very firstly connect to these things properly. Many of you are accustomed to living your life in routine, very desensitized from these decisions which we are referring to so constantly. It has become automatic, a pattern, a thing that you do without much feeling. And if you are to commence this, this period of growth over the next year, for which we see much potential, by the way, in, in almost every one of you. If you are to engage this process, then we encourage you first to become more sensitive to your own lives, to your own desires, and to the things that you wish to hold on to rather than let go. Because it is true in this process, you will need to let go of many things. Many things that you currently believe are loving. Many things that you wish to hold on to the belief that they are true and good and that you should base your life on. As you engage this process of humility and longing for truth and love from our Heavenly Father, you will begin to find that many of these things that you wish to hold on to are perhaps not as good or wise or solid as you thought. But first you must understand that you do want them. These are things which you wish to hold on to and to let yourself feel how much you want to hold on to these things. For this is essential if you are to understand why they are present in your life. So this is perhaps the first part of our message that we wish to convey around the issue of desire and the things that you currently treasure. Be willing to feel these things as they currently are. To take a snapshot, if you like, of your life and who you are and what you want right now today. What are the things that have brought you to today? The emotions and the decisions and the reasons why you took these decisions, which are all emotional. Let yourself Know yourself as you are right now, today. Begin this process of discovery of who you are, of what you have created through your will up until this point in your life. This is such a powerful exercise. And in fact, for many of it, you, it may take some months or even the year that which, before we meet again. To simply come to know yourself as you really are, it, the injuries, the emotions, even some of the passions hiding underneath your fears. But to know yourself emotionally as you are, this is the crucial first step if you are to change through humility. Within many of you, there is the temptation to judge who you have become who you are right now in this moment. But judgment does nothing but slow this progression. And judgment is in fact the choice to avoid feeling who you are and how you are right now. 
Judgment is the choice to distance yourself from what is already inside of you right now. The pains, the desires, the lust, the greed, the shame, the fear. For some of you, the terror. Yet these are the things that make up you who you are today. And God is not judging those things. In fact, God has this infinite compassion for who you are right now. And is always and ever hopeful, as far as we experience him, of the capacity for everyone to change. So even though you may be tempted over the coming months to judge what you discover inside of yourself, each time that you do, recognize that that is just a choice to get away from how you really feel. And it will only slow your progression. Let yourself be imperfect. Let yourself acknowledge the things inside of you that are not in harmony with love or truth. And simply recognize that these things which have been driving your will up until now will need to be felt fully and released if you are to change your desires. There is no quick fix. There is no simple changing course on the GPS as many of you uh, so luxuriously do now. If you miss the turn off, something recalculates for you. <laughs> in this journey, it is necessary to stop in the point where we miss the turn off and to feel why, to feel what happened, to really experience ourselves without judgment and to ask for God's assistance in this journey. And this is perhaps the second major thing that we would like to speak to you about today. And that is not to neglect this precious relationship that you now know is available to you. To connect with God. This has been the most changing and fulfilling relationship in our lives. And indeed we do not, we cannot conceive how, how beautiful life can become, even in our state of imperfection, if we engage God in this process. God's will and God's desire and intent is to assist us in each one of these steps. And God is very aware of how precious and important each step is. So while you may feel that you are very, very far from the place that you would dream yourself to be, do not neglect each step that you take with God because each step is another opportunity for God to show you her love, for you to open your heart and let her love enter to change you and to grow this relationship that we see that most of you desire so deeply. So while you are becoming aware of yourselves as you truly are right now, ask God to help you see even more clearly. And ask for God's love in the knowledge that this love will assist you to change and to grow.
we would like now to invite any questions. And perhaps we would ask Jesus first if he would like to ask any questions. I'm thinking that the best way to proceed probably is just perhaps we do need the extra mic as long as that sound isn't going to cause us the trouble. like it's going to cause us a trouble <laughs> so maybe perhaps perhaps we should simplify things and simply um... is it going the mic can you just yep so we can use the mic let's try that for a bit and we'll go from there who would like to ask Rachel a question thanks what? How do how how do I come to know who my guide is? Floyd, this is a wonderful question. In fact, we wish more people would ask this question of them of themselves. In fact, your guide is someone who is already so close to you um, that it is simply a matter of you beginning to open your awareness to him. He has been with you since childhood and is very fond of you. He shares much of your um, interest in people and in learning. And he is um, simply waiting almost for you to ask these questions. How can I come to know you? Can we suggest and again, this is at the suggestion of your guide, <laughs> um, that as you wake in the morning, to simply lie and as you take some moments for prayer, also ask to become aware of your guide, his presence with you. And you can begin to experiment with asking things like, what is his name and what would he like to share with you? And you will find yourself far more open to him than you are currently aware. In fact, he feels satisfied that very often throughout your day he is able to give you guidance. So this is, a, this is great news. This means you are already open to him, but it is simply this relationship that you have not been as aware of. And by that I mean you have not been so aware that there is one person there with you, assisting you. You have been open to him because you share many of the same passions and you are a reasonably humble fellow who would like to do the right thing and learn. And so you, you are naturally asking questions throughout your day and because Benjamin, who this is the name of your guide, because he is there constantly with you, he is able to give you some thoughts or feelings. He's, he's able to... Um, send his feelings, if you like, towards you. And this provides you with some inspiration. Uh, so his feeling is for you, especially Floyd, is to simply experiment with the fact that he may indeed be there and allow this relationship to grow between you. So in the morning, if you simply experiment with having a conversation with him and perhaps in the evening as well as you are going off to sleep, he feels confident that you will be able to develop a much uh, closer rapport with him and in fact begin to be able to discern more readily in your day-to-day -day, um, goings-on when it is him who is near you and who is providing guidance. He wishes to connect with you not only through your intellect but through your heart. So if you are able to open your heart at these times when you ask to become more aware of him and to speak with him, then this will help him to uh, establish a better connection with you. Is there anything else you would like to ask about that?
was there a time that I don't re- remember from my childhood that I knew who he was? Yes, cer- certainly. He's saying, as a young boy, you spent many hours together, in fact, playing and exploring. But as you grew, you became less trusting of the fact that he was a, he was a real presence in your life. And, but you never lost your feeling of openness towards him. And this is why he still feels he has been able to be with you quite often throughout your life and to be able to guide you. But yes, as I am relaying from him, you spent many good hours together when you were quite a young boy. Thank you. He is saying that he would love to continue this conversation with you in person, Floyd. So. Um, okay, who had their hand up next? Uh, shall we go across, yeah, up the back? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for being with us. And I just wondered, in, when I'm journaling, is it usually talking to my guide, specifically? By this, Donna, you mean when you are writing in yeah. your journal, yes. are you communicating with your guide? No. Yeah. Oftentimes you are not. Okay. Because you are quite resistive to certain issues in your life, certain large areas of addiction, in fact, that our brother has been attempting to make you all aware of throughout this week. Because of this, you become quite limited in your journaling. You are not open to new truth entering because you are quite afraid of the challenge that will happen internally when, you, when your addictions are confronted. In fact, there is a great deal of sadness within you that you busily avoid uh, in your day-to-day life. And you have become quite resistive to feeling this sadness. Because of this, uh, in many of your spiritual pursuits, in your prayer, in your journaling, there has developed a rigidity. You feel quite rigid about what you are open to receiving and even what you are open to feeling. So our advice to you would be to work on this issue of rigidity inside of yourself, surrounding your emotions and the new ideas that you will allow into your, into your life, especially those ideas that pertain to you or the truths that pertain to you. If you are able to... Um, simply as we've mentioned in the first part of our message, to become aware and to feel this rigidity within you and the anger that is driving it. As you are able to do this, then you will soften and there will be more capacity for your guides to connect with you. At the moment, you have two female guides and they are quite often with you and nearby you but they are quite limited in how they can assist you at the moment because of this rigid feeling that you have about change. You do not wish to change greatly or wish to change your life greatly. And because of this, they are unable to to share with you the ways in which you might become more happy or joyful. So our advice is to simply work on this issue of rigidity and the anger underneath it. And this will help you not only in your journaling, but in your prayer life and, the, and in your emotional healing work. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for speaking with us. It's our pleasure, Boris. My question is, um, what's uh, our or my biggest impediment to opening the soulmate part of my soul? For you, our brother Boris, 
there are, there are a number of things that we would wish to highlight. Firstly is the issue of fear. You have a great deal of fear that you um, are not experiencing in surrounding your relationship with your mother. And this prevents you really sincerely desiring an open-hearted um, a non a non barter may we say a non barter relationship with a woman because there is a great deal of fear about what what the woman will deliver towards you the rage or the criticism that will come towards you should you open your heart completely so there is a lot of fear that covers some deep grief about this issue and this this actually creates an investment inside of you um, in not challenging the codependence in your, in your current relationship. If, but we see at the moment that the major, the major block is your, your lack of humility to the emotion of fear. So while you may be aware of certain issues in your relationship with your mother and sadness that you have there, it is this fear that is capping this that we feel um, prevents the release of those issues, and which would the release of these issues would open your heart more fully, um, and also begin to open this soulmate part of yourself. The other major issue we would say in that is keeping the soulmate part of yourself closed down is an issue surrounding. And somewhat related, but it is surrounding your own um, desire to experience your passions and your desires. You are a soul with much creativity, and at the moment, because of certain fears that you have, you stifle everything that you wish to discover and do in your day to day life. You do this again because of some codependent reasons. But also there is a, this issue from childhood where you have suppressed a lot of your um, creative potentials and desires. You are someone who likes to, to make things on a large scale in your true nature. And at the moment you play things quite small in your life. So if you are able to work on both of these things, Firstly, the codependence and the fear you have um, surrounding challenging the codependence. And then also to the fear of fully experiencing everything, every creative um, idea, an adventurous idea inside of yourself. These two things will begin to open the soulmate part of you. At the moment, there is a resistance to even knowing yourself more fully. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, what kind of questions can I ask my guide so that I can get to know her better? What, would, what kind of questions would she like me to answer? <laughs> the simplest answer is that she would like you to ask anything that you desire to get to know her. Mm -hmm. she, um, many of your spirit guides feel a little um, perplexed at times that, um, that many of you regard them as sort of these ethereal mm -hmm. beings far off into the distance who are not just as real as someone who sits in front of you. So um, your guide, Selena, would like to say, what would you ask me if you had me around for tea? Yeah, well, I feel like she's my friend. And <laughs> This I, is how she feels yeah, for you. Yeah. She feels very much and that. I feel so much love for her, and sometimes I just, and sometimes we laugh, and, you know, and I just, what else can I ask you so that we can have a deeper friendship? Because I feel like the more I know about her, the more I know about myself. Yeah. yeah. She would like you not to neglect this learning about yourself, though, either. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the major things that she sees that um, blocks your your full expression and also your connection with her is some um, deeply held insecurities about little Selena and feeling um, unhappy with uh, 
parts of yourself and that often makes you emotionally shy to share with her and to connect mm -hmm. with her. There is still a fear that you will be judged or rejected and so you have many addictions in your day-to-day -day life where you cover over that and you, um, you at times are you live far away from that and in fact appear to be quite the opposite a very worldly confident woman but um, your guide wishes to say that there is these insecurities and not to neglect those and not to be afraid to give up some of your more dominant addictions that help you avoid these things thank you she says that your relationship with women and the the sadness and some of the competition feelings that you have with women in order to avoid some issues in your relationship with your mother mm -hmm. limit her capacity to um, connect with you more fully. So if you are able to look at, to fully feel and understand the feelings of competition you have at times with other women, this will help you not only in your growth towards God, but with your connection with her. Thank you very much. Boris, I was just wondering if you could maybe focus on the audience now rather than myself, and I'll just sort of back off a little. So, Mary's. Okay, so if we go across to Sai. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I've really felt quite blocked the last few days. Something really big has come up for me, and I've felt very disconnected from from my guides and I seem to feel a lot of confusion at the moment about whether I even have one and and that's really causing me some some distress and panic and and maybe I just need to feel those feelings uh. Sai we can see and as you are very aware um, throughout your life, you have had some very strong relationships with different groups of spirits. And you are starting to become even more aware of uh, just how much spirit interaction has happened in your life. Because of this, there is this new fear building. And as you put it, a panic. Oh, who can I trust? And is anyone really there who has my best interests at heart? And we simply encourage you to feel through these um, addictions that you have had with spirits throughout your life. There is no need to panic because we see a number of very beautiful guides who are waiting to connect with you more strongly. And they are very patient and aware that their connection with you will be um, much better once you, once you simply let yourself feel some shame and grief and fear surrounding the spirits that have um, punctuated the different phases of your life, if you like, up until now. Does, is that clear to yes. you? Yes. Yes. Thank so you. they feel very strongly that there is no need to panic, but simply to allow yourself to really work through um, the reasons why certain spirits were attracted to you, the issues inside of yourself, these addictions that you have been speaking about over the past week. And as you do this, you will become more sensitive emotionally inside of yourself. And this is what they are longing for because their connection with you they wish to make in a very emotional way. And so as you are able to simply work through more of these addictions, become more aware of the spirits that have been around you. At the moment, there is a, there is a temptation to block any more knowledge of any more spirits because it's already felt a little tumultuous for you. But if you are able to stay open and really feel through these different things, they feel quite excited about the very sensitive man, um, a man who's very sensitive to his own emotions that they will be able to connect to. They feel that um, when you are able to be sensitive to both the injury and the loving emotions that exist within you, 
you will be far more discerning about who is actually with you in spirit. And um, if you think about it in the past, you haven't been very discerning because you've been about having some addictions met. But as you work through these things, your discernment will grow and this will mean that you will feel them quite a bit more strongly because you will be able to feel their love quite strongly. And this is perhaps um, an important message for all of the group, which is about becoming, uh, as you become more sensitive to yourself emotionally, this will make you more sensitive to love and the absence of love. And for, for your guides, most of whom are on the divine love path, they, they very much enjoy um, connecting with you via emotions. So as you become more emotional, um, you will be able to sense their love, their compassion, their excitement and enthusiasm for you more sensitive. You'll be more sensitive to the feelings that they have for you. So um, this means that you become a far more discerning listener. You will know when your guides are speaking with you, but you will also become more sensitive to spirits who wish to... Um, enter into addictions with you or who wish to um, lead you down a path which is not uh, loving or um, good for your growth. So we would encourage all of you to, um, to see the very many benefits of simply connecting to what is inside of you right now. Thank you. Here you go, Lawrence, thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Rachel. And my, my question has to do with the fact that I, I live in Mexico and I would like to... Bring those mics over. Yeah. Just give us a little moment. So you've got another mic coming behind you. I would like to uh, um, establish more friendships in Mexico and particularly to share divine truth with people there. And at the same time, I have a lot of fear to begin with. I'm kind of socially awkward. I don't speak the language. And um, I'm just wondering if there's anything more I can do or should not do in terms of my further integration with that culture. Um, our dearest brother Lawrence, we feel that the more important question for you right now is how you may love yourself more. You have spent so many years, and even we feel within your question, this, this desire to, to improve and to grow, but inherent in it is also a feeling that, that you are, that you are might fearing doing the wrong thing and that, that somehow um, the fault lies uh, with, with you. And um, this is a big injury for you as, as we know that our brother and sister here in front of you have spoken with you about. We feel that as you begin to take time to love you more, to know you more, and to see the truth of what has happened in your relationships in your early childhood, you will, you will grow and the best way that we can think to say it is that at the moment it is, is if you are almost keeping yourself as small as a wounded sparrow, but we see within you the potential for a soaring eagle. But it is only these emotions which you... You are, again, as many here, very accustomed to not being sensitive to how how poorly you treat yourself in terms of emotionally. You spare little time for really coming to know yourself and valuing yourself. 
and instead spend much time addictively, even, even in a situation where you feel quite socially isolated, you are often giving out great amounts of energy to spirits around you who wish to keep you feeling small and wounded. It is true there are wounds and injuries within you and there is much grief for you to feel. But we feel that as you do this, as you stop, and really we encourage you to long for the truth about what has happened in your childhood and the emotions that you have received and the patterns that you have taken on of continually um, feeling that you are the one who is lacking and you are the one who must make up for the things that are lacking. Uh, if you are able to pause and simply begin to give yourself care and attention, so rather than, as in the past, looking for others to give you the care and attention, if you stop and if you are able to feel your loneliness and begin to extend some love to yourself and the type of love that was was very absent in your childhood was this simple respect for your true personality and nature and the uniqueness of Lawrence. So if you are able to begin to explore those things and emotionally feel those things, then you will, you will see your life change, brother, quite markedly and more rapidly than you think is possible. And you will not be asking us such questions of uh, uh, how can I share divine truth more or what should I do because you will find yourself busy and happy but filled with a, a new sense of confidence in yourself and confidence in your desires that, that what you desire, as long as it is in harmony with love, then it is worthwhile. At the moment, you do not have this feeling for yourself. You, you feel that many of your desires are not worthy. And so we would encourage you towards feeling about these things and let this expansion that we see, this potential that we see within you, begin to commence. And you will attract many people and they will be asking you the questions surrounding how you are making this great change. And... and while your abilities in the Spanish language will grow, there will be those who will be seeking out their English language dictionary just to ask that gringo what he's up to. May, may I add a comment there too? Um, when, you think about it, when you think about it, you've made the perfect choice to be in a country where you've now got no distractions to actually get to know yourself. So the fact that you can't speak the language and the fact that you can't, you know, have a lot of interactions with people that they understand is actually to your benefit. Because, because as you know, you've been giving yourself away far too much to other people when you're in any English language country. And, uh, and I feel partly your guide has, uh, has sort of encouraged you to move there to help you have that fit, have that sense of personal isolation that's required for you to get to know yourself, because you're so you've been so dependent on interacting with other people um, to feed some of these addictions. Does that make sense? And so I feel you're in a perfect situation actually to grow your sense of self worth. Better situation than if you were in America or in Australia or some other English speaking country. So that's the first thing. And the second thing I'd just like to reiterate is Rachel's last comment to you, and that is once you build your self-worth, you will automatically start attracting all the things you need to share the truth with others. That's, that will just be an automatic process after that. You won't have to make it happen. It will just start happening around you because of your soul attractions, drawing the, all of those things to you. So... If you can see your current move to Mexico, not as a move to help them, but rather as a move to have, help you have some kind of isolation to help yourself, <laughs> um, I think you'd benefit immensely then by sort of spending a lot more time inside of, you know, working your way through some of those emotions from your childhood that prevent you from having any value of yourself at all. 
And also what will happen is your chronic fatigue, the, the illness that you carry, will disappear. And once that disappears, you'll start feeling some kind of sense of yourself and sense of your own worth. And once that happens, I feel you'll start drawing people to you rather than needing to go out and find them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we come across to David, thanks. thanks. Hi, Rachel, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, when I'm actually um, asking my guide for suggestions, am I able to actually connect with him or am I connecting with uh, a lot of different other spirits? At times you do achieve a connection with your guide, but largely there are many spirits around you, David, who wish to have interactions with you. Some of these can see that you are quite a good medium and so they simply, they just want to elbow their way in and as soon as you open yourself up, they provide an answer just so they can have some connection with you. Others are a little less innocent and they wish to lead you in the direction of addiction. And this is where it is important for you to become more discerning about the content as regard, in regards to love and truth of the messages that you are receiving. By this we mean if you receive a message which could be questionable if you really analyse it logically with regards to love, then this is, this is an indication that you need to question the source of this message. You are quite a sensitive person, you are quite a sensitive man, as a very sensitive soul and you will be able to um, begin to sense the different character and personality of the spirits who come to you. And at times, if you think about it, you already are sensing the different character. So you're not only taking their word for it of who is coming, but you're actually able to sense, oh, this person feels different from this other person. However, there are times that because of your addictions, you do not wish to sense the character of the people who are coming to you. And we wish to warn you strongly about this. Because you also have many issues surrounding loneliness, you are tempted to fill this gap with interactions with spirits. And so while you uh, neglect the grief of your loneliness, you will be tempted to believe certain people are guiding you when actually they are just meeting the addiction um, for you to avoid feeling sad and alone. As you are more willing to grieve your loneliness, then you will have more desire to know who is really speaking with you. And as you do, you will find that your aptitude as a medium will increase very strongly. Um, and you have much potential to not only be guided and assisted for yourself, but to assist others um, through channeling the people around them and their guides for them. However, again, we caution you that this is a skill that will only really um, have the potential to come in harmony with, with love and a more pure desire once you deal with some of this core sadness that you are carrying at the moment. Until then, I would simply measure the, measure the messages I am receiving with some discernment and pray about becoming more sensitive to your own loneliness. Thank you. I was wondering if I may ask about my guide, who I've, I've not felt as much in the recent past, and if I could possibly verify if I got the name correct. Our brother, do you see an issue in this question? Probably. Would you, would you like to analyze the question? Analyze the emotions that are driving the question? I Rather thought instead of asking one question, I probably, people in the room made me think, 
it would be best to connect with the guide who is always with us. And I have felt kind of the sadness of the distance for a while now because I was more connected before and less so now. And I thought it might be a good um, thing for me to reconnect. Yes, but this question is driven by this large feeling inside of yourself that you do not wish to make that effort. And this is why your guide has make, to make that effort for yourself, to really ask and desire and reach out to your guide. And this is the reason that your guide has stepped back from you recently, uh, over uh, some time now it has been, has it not, that you have felt some distance from your guide. And that is because um, your guide, and in fact you have, you have had in the past up to three guides, and they have felt like a cheer squad cheering you on and attempting to encourage you and inspire you. But over time, they felt that there was... Um, indeed, they felt that you had come to rely on them heavily in this role. And they came to see that it was most loving that they would step back. And in fact, two have, two have left you at this time. One still remains. But he does not feel that he can be as close to you until you begin to embrace desire more actively in your life, to, to be less reliant on others. And especially he found that you were reliant on him quite heavily. Of course, he loves you very dearly and, and wishes to see your progress. He, but he himself is not yet at one with God, although on the divine love path. And he had some lessons to learn in the early days about perhaps giving too much to you and not encouraging you to develop this um, not only will and desire but um, the issue of taking responsibility for your own progress. This is an area, brother, that you have been neglecting for a long time. You see what is ahead of you and in fact you are very bright and have much potential but you do not wish to take those first steps, those first sticky steps they often feel to be because we're a bit stuck in mud and sometimes it takes time and effort to get some, some momentum and progress happening. And for yourself, you have felt that um, you would like to be pushed over the first sticky steps and your guides are no longer willing to, um, to provide as much encouragement or interaction with you until you learn this very first basic lesson of taking the step and using your will and taking responsibility for that which is inside of you already. So this is why you feel the distance and this is why I'm prevented from sharing with you the name because um, it is your guide's desire that you begin to take responsibility for your own progression. And I'll probably be a bit more blunt than that, Enrique. Um, you want other people to do the work for you. And this is why your guides have stepped back, because they can feel from you this desire that you have, that they do a lot of the work for you by giving you information. And, and that causes you then to think that you don't have to do the work for yourself. And, and if, you, if you could engage this really strong uh, sort of work, I would call it almost like a work ethic, for a change in your life where you engage the effort for yourself you'll find that your guys will come and help you very rapidly but at this moment they can't help you because they can feel that you're wanting them to do the work for you and and if you think about it in your day-to-day -day life too this is frequently the problem with your relationships with others you want the other person to do the work for you and as a result um, a lot of people will step back from you as a result, because they can feel that underlying demand coming out of you towards them. So, so I sort of feel quite strongly that besides the issue of personal responsibility, there's this also this issue of looking at why, what, what is the anger within you that drives you to believe that other people should do the work for you, rather than you having to take responsibility for your own choices and decisions and desires. And Rachel will probably have a few bit more to say about my comment there. 
No, no. We just we were having our private joke with Miriam about this situation. <laughs> uh, not about the situation of our brother Enrico, but the situation of um, our clarity being uh, less precise or less direct as we would like because of some of her injuries. Do you understand that as a group? Like, because Mary sometimes feels like if she really states exactly what they state, that some of you would be quite shocked. Um, she sort of has this desire then to sort of step back from stating exactly and, and toning it down a bit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whereas one of the first things I felt from Rachel as soon as you asked your question, Enrique, was this, you're trying to make us responsible now, <laughs> type of feeling come from her. And that's exactly the case. You, you are attempting to do that. Yeah. This phenomena, this interaction that happens between us as a spirit and the medium is something which we would like to channel about at some time in the future because it is um, at times quite a... Um, it is uh, because we are interacting and we are souls and driven emotionally, um, often even the medium is not putting up thought barriers, but we wish to state certain things and the emotional impediments within the medium often prevent the direct clarity that we uh, would like to have. We are able to be firm with Miriam and if you observe as she continues to speak we are able to convey more messages and um, uh, more images of exactly the thing we would wish to say but it is not exactly as we would wish to speak to all of you um, in a number of ways. She limits the love which we, ha which we wish to express because of some of her own uh, grief. But also, there are times when we wish to be very succinct and direct, and yet, while there is not a thought process that occurs, there is a limiting of how quickly that can occur. So, but at some other time in the future with our brother, we would like to record some message about how, what actually happens in this interaction we have. Um, between us as spirits and mediums on earth. Yeah, the, um, it's interesting really in a lot of ways because it's actually the emotional impediments that have the largest barrier. So, it's, so even the belief systems of the medium don't matter too much as long as those belief systems are not limiting emotional expression. Uh, but as soon as the belief systems limit emotional expression, then of course there is a big limitation on what the, the spirits can give to you. And the other thing is that all of our celestial spirits know that the truth is like a sword. Like it, it just cuts through the barriers immediately. So, so they're not afraid of using the truth like a sword. Does that make sense? It's only we that are afraid of accepting it as, as a loving process. And so... Um, if you think about the, if you think about if you're cutting pieces of paper, um, you'd prefer to have generally a sharp pair of scissors, or if you were cutting your hair, you would prefer to have a sharp pair of scissors, and the sharpness of the scissors will determine the preciseness of the cut, and it will determine how accurate the cut is, and where the cut goes. And, uh, and even whether it was effective at all or not. If it's really blunt, you'll just cut a piece of paper and instead of cutting the piece of paper, it'll just bend the piece of paper. It won't even cut it. And if in, in, a, in a similar manner, if the, the medium's emotions are like the dulling of the blade, if you like. Does that make sense? Of truth that can be shared with you. Now, of course, one of the other things to bear in mind is that your emotions also dull the blade. So the more you feel opposition to what's being said to you, the less they can actually say. Because what you're doing is you're using or exercising your will to avoid what they're saying to you. So there's only so much they can express to you without feeling the barrier of your will and then feeling like, well, wait, we can't share any more after that because your will now is being exercised to not hear. So a lot of people have a strong desire to receive messages from the spirit world, they think. But unfortunately, 
the emotion coming from them, their emotional desire, if you like, is such that there is a barrier that is, that is formed and, and, it, and it disallows certain things from being shared. And so the key from a receiver's perspective is to look at how you're exercising your will. Do you really want to know the truth? And many of you believe you do, but it is like we started at the, state of, at the start of this. You remember the session on Saturday uh, and that second session on the Saturday where I said, I asked you a question, do you want to know your addictions? And you all said, yes, yes, we desperately want to know our addictions. And yet the previous day had demonstrated that none of you wanted to know your addictions through your actions. And this is where we often try to, th we think that we are in one condition uh, and, and the reality is the feeling coming out of us is quite another. And this severely affects Rachel and other, and also your guides' abilities to share truth with you. Yeah. Okay, who would like to go next? Let come down the front here. Uh, Hi, Rachel. I would like to find out about um, my, um, similar to Boris's question, what can I do to help facilitate my soulmate, part of my soul, and also to my opening to my guide as well? Thank you. Well, first you must acknowledge that at the moment you do not desire your soulmate at all. And this is, this is a part of yourself that you do not even wish to be aware of, but it is very strong within you. You have certain emotions and beliefs which make you feel, the feeling that we feel from you is that you certainly do not wish to have your soulmate in your life. And so this is the first place to start, to understand, as we mentioned earlier, exactly why that is and to feel that desire within yourself, to acknowledge the truth of it, not because we have said it, but because you begin to feel it. As you do that, this will uncover many addictions that you have with the opposite gender and many ties that you still have with your father and certain beliefs you have about men in general and yourself as a woman. But very first, and if we are able to be sharper here um, than we have been, we will simply say that you, at the moment you do not wish to ha have the soulmate part of you open or to know your soulmate. This is the place for you to start. Mm. As regards to your guides, there are similar feelings in, in the sense that there are specific reasons that you do not wish to be guided in certain areas. Similar to what we shared with Donna, there is a certain rigidity within you about emotions which you will allow and emotions which you, you judge and you will not and you do not feel are acceptable for you to have inside of yourself. This is the main thing that limits your connection with your guides. At times they are able to connect with you but still, more often than not, there are natural love uh, spirits or spirits more aligned with New Age teachings who are connecting with you. And they, they feed certain addictions you have to feeling that you are generally happy and a nice person. You, Catherine, inside of yourself you have um, a large idea of the sort of person that you wish to be the sort of person that you feel will be lovable to, or to others. And you spend a lot of time um, harboring or using energy to create this facade of this person that you feel will be most lovable. In fact, the real you is far more beautiful, but at the moment you judge some of the emotions which are inside of the real you. And because of that, you, you limit a lot uh, your guide's connection to you. They wish to share with you these things that are inside of you. Some are very beautiful qualities about yourself that you have not yet discovered, and some are painful, fearful, shameful things from your childhood, and th these things that have coloured other 
events in your life and your guides wish to help you explore what happened in those events and what the, what the emotional origins of those things were in your childhood. But at the moment, you're quite afraid of this. So if you can pray about your fear and about letting go of, of the Catherine that you believe is more lovable than the real Catherine, then this will help your guides, but it will also help your progress. May we suggest an activity to you? And that is to write yourself a list of all the things that you believe you must be in order to be loved and to be lovable. If you are able to do this, you will begin to see how much energy you are spending trying to be these things and be these ways. And if you analyze that list in relation to God and the way that God loves, you will begin to see that many of the things that you are trying to um, achieve and maintain are not necessary for you to be loved because God is already loving you and anyone who already loves, loves you. But also that many of these things you are trying to maintain are actually things that are keeping you away from more truth and more humility and more growth in your life. It's almost as if you have set yourself up a contract that you need to be a certain way. And because you have, you have been keeping this contract to yourself and spending a lot of energy on it for many, many years, you now feel quite frightened to just simply confront this list that you have inside of yourself. But believe us, when you confront it and begin to have the courage to challenge it and to, to act in ways that are not necessarily the things on your list, um, you, you will feel more growth, more growth than you have felt in many years, in fact. Thank you very much. Hey, Marty. Yes. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for your gift of love. It's just so healing to be with someone so loving. Um, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions when I return home um, on how I can begin to change um, around my engaging life with a belief of lack that is so deep within me. The major issue for, for yourself, our sister, is terrible fear of, of being attacked and you live in this state of lack almost as a way to appease the people around you the very at times there are dark spirits around you who wish to to keep you in this very small place and and it is almost as if you wish to remain in a state of lack simply to appease any other possible attack that might come your way so we would encourage you to look at your fears surrounding abusers, abusers on earth and in the spirit world. And we know that you are accustomed or you are, you are acquainted with the fact that this, is, that this is an issue for you. But at the moment you are still um, spending much of your will or expending much of your will in appeasing abusers rather than feeling their abuse and beginning to challenge it emotionally. And by that we mean to say, that's not okay emotionally. So if we can, um, we wish to really stress this point that much of your energy is still going into appeasing or making, treating yourself badly, making yourself small, not accepting, receiving anything good for yourself because you very much fear what the spirits around you will do if you do something different. And the issue of lack in your life is very much related to this same issue. So if you are able to go home and begin to feel about being abused rather than trying to placate or please abusers 
uh, to keep them. It is almost as if you want to just keep them at bay so you could just have a tiny piece of space just for yourself. It's, it's almost as if you're saying, I'm not asking for much, just please can I have this one little corner and please leave me alone. Um, it, is this, it is this feeling inside of you that perpetuates the lack. And in fact, God does not want to, live, to have you live in this tiny little corner. Um, you were made to, to, um, uh, to cover the world and to have a great, wonderful life, both here on earth and in the spirit world. And you have spent much of your life keeping yourself quite small out of this fear. If you are able to challenge this fear, your issues of lack will change, but also you will have much more joy. Thank you. And can I just make a general comment about abusers and being abused? Um, When we have been abused in our childhood or even violently abused or even been condescended to in our childhood, there is a high likelihood that we have all these belief systems inside of ourselves that will continue to attract abuse for the rest of our lives. And the main reason why we attract the abuse is not for any other reason than that we're terrified of confronting the abuser. Does that make sense? And from a spiritual level, in particular, Madi, that's what's happening for yourself. There's a deep terror of confronting the spirit-based abusers of of, of you. But also, if you look at it physically, you're always attracting people who abuse you. Even people who don't normally abuse other people abuse you which is an indication that the whole is so large that, that even though... And I'm not suggesting that, they, that it's your fault they're abusing you. I'm suggesting they feel that you will accept abuse very easily. And as a result, because they don't have any personal ethics, they start to abuse you. And this is what actually happened on the forum, like on the, the local Facebook forum that you've been involved with. It, everyone's getting drawn into it and then the spirits that are with you frequently find it so easy to abuse you right, because of because of this openness to the views and um, they can easily then influence these other people to say things they possibly even wouldn't normally say right and so this causes a lot of uh, distress in you and so what you as as rachel's saying you're, you're trying to now withdraw to just a little tiny corner of, a, of the world, like you're sitting in the tiny corner of the room saying, just give me this amount of space, but leave me alone. Right? When actually God created your soul to take up the whole space of your whole house. You know, like that's, the, that's the contrast, if you like, that you need to picture in your mind. And, and the only reason why you're withdrawing to a little corner in a little room is because you're getting attacked all the time and you don't want to feel the grief associated with this attack. And, and this is the case with most of us when we get attacked we don't want to face the grief of being attacked and so what we do is we withdraw we, we detune from our desires we detune from our passions we even detune from ourselves in order to avoid this attack but all we're doing is falling into the trap of these darker people who want us to feel smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller so that they can feel bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So every little bit of energy you give out make, making yourself smaller, they take to make themselves bigger. And this is the emotional hole that's going to close up. And it's not going to close up by you saying, don't do that to me anymore. It's going to close up by you feeling the grief associated with the attack and the fear and terror, uh, literal terror that you have about attack. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, because I am by myself a lot and these spirits are doing that, I'll just start to tune in. Like, I'll be, it'll become clearer to me what they're doing and saying to me. I feel it's already clear what they're doing. You just don't want to believe it. There's a feeling in you that you'd like to believe that everyone's really got a good heart at the end of the day. You know, and that's not true, unfortunately. While everybody has, at some point, the ability to go back to their pure soul, it doesn't mean right at this moment that they've got a good heart and they're trying to work in your best interest. The reality is there are many billions of people on earth and in the spirit world who don't have anybody else's best interest at heart. And in fact, all they want to do is ta- attack and abuse other people. And, and 
your fear allows them to continue doing it. Your terror, the unwillingness to experience terror and the unwillingness to experience the grief about being attacked for no reason. You've always tried to blame yourself and made out and sort of make out that you're the problem, but you're not the problem. You're not the reason they attack you. They have attacked you, and then you've made yourself smaller and smaller and smaller, and that encourages their attack. But that's not, that's not the reason why they attack you at the beginning. They attack you at the beginning because they're basically just not very nice people. <laughs> Does that make sense? And it's their problem. And this is something we've got to understand when we're getting attacked, is that anybody who attacks you is, is in a terrible condition of love. Right? And, and may I just point out, some of you have been involved in some of these interactions with Motti uh, on the internet and so forth, where you got drawn into attacking her. And what I would say to you is, firstly, what inside of yourself caused you to revert to judgment so much? And what inside of yourself caused you to believe that it was okay to attack a person who already was down. It's like, you know, it's like kicking a person who's already on the floor. Does that make sense? And this is what spirits do frequently with us. But, but if we're going to learn how to love, we've got to stop doing that with each other. If a person's already on the floor, you don't kick them a bit more. What you want to do is help them off the floor and help them work their way through why they're so afraid rather than doing the opposite to that. So, so my suggestion is anyone who has been involved in these attacks of Mahdi, because there's been quite a number of them, um, looks, and, and there is an openness in you to those attacks, this is what I'm suggesting, which is about your grief and so forth. But there is an openness into the others who attack you to, to be easily influenced away from ethical behaviour and into attack to make themselves feel better than you or feel like they are better than you or judge you as if they are better than you and so forth. And they need to have a look at that, those emotions. Yeah. So I just wanted to make that aside because, uh, um, because I feel what's going on in the attack of you, it hasn't been just spirits attacking you, it's also been people who are even in this room who have even reverted to attacking you over the internet. And, and that demonstrates the unloving, or, or should we say, the unethical position inside of those persons where if they notice somebody is down, they think it's a great opportunity to take to make themselves feel better. And that, that, so I would look at those emotions too if you've been involved in those things. Yeah. Thank you. Two more questions. Two more questions Rachel would like to do. Would Rachel like to choose the last two? You keep your hands up. Scott has his hand up. I'm not trusting Rachel. Yeah. Scott has his hand up, yeah. Hi, Rachel. She kept saying, Scott, Scott. I'm like, <laughs> what if I get it wrong? I was afraid of getting it wrong, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you could make suggestions for us so we can become more open to the possibility of actually seeing you and your friends in, in person, in physical, in the future? Well, there are many ways that you could see us in future. Many of us, many of you see us in your sleep state already. We, we know each other and we do sit down for tea sometimes, although not real tea. <laughs> um, but we sit down and speak with you at times in your sleep state. So this is one way that some of you already employ, but others of you could begin to desire more actively to, to, come, to meet us in your sleep state. And, and then we can engineer any number of plans for your awake state to help you in your growth. But the second way you might begin to see us is if you develop your spiritual senses, if you like, your mediumistic senses, and you begin to sense spirits around you. Now, the major impediment to you being able to do that, and by this we mean you begin to see people who don't have a physical body but have their sp a spiritual body, but you can begin to see them when they're around you on earth. 
the major impediment that every one of you has to this is fear. Fear of dark spirits, but also fear of us lighter spirits. Some of you fear going crazy, or feeling that you will be going crazy. And some of you fear, you simply fear um, being overwhelmed by people, if you like. Many of you at a young age were far more sensitive to the spirits that were around, but felt very overwhelmed and um, that there was no space for you. And so you shut down many of these spiritual senses. So that is another emotion that you would need to work on if you were to see us and perceive us more strongly. And then, of course, there are those who are just simply afraid of attack and f afraid of the dark, the dark um, spirits that are around. And many of you have been very aware of them. And many of you are still very aware of them, but you, you spend a lot of your time distracting yourself from that awareness. And then there is the also very obvious issue which Jesus has already covered with you, which is your own desire to be confronted emotionally, in, even in a positive sense, to, to be confronted by someone in front of you loving you very, in a very pure way or giving you a very direct truth that um, might feel a little like the surgeon's knife that we referred to in, in the book that Jesus read to you earlier in the week. So these issues are all issues which affect your ability to perceive us and to see us even when we are in our spirit form. But we think that our, our brother Scott is really referring to seeing us in a physical body. And this is a dream that many of us have and that is to be able to, to have our own return to earth, although it's not really a return in the, in the way that you, this brother and sister in front of you are here. But um, to be able to manifest a physical body again on the earth simply for the purpose of delivering truth about the spirit world and the truth of God Many of us have had the opportunity to manifest a physical body briefly to assist a person um, with a personal issue uh, at a certain crucial moment in their life. But to be able to come simply for the purpose of saying, we exist and we live in a sphere that is not like here, that is um, a place where God's laws are very evident in everything that we do in every decision that we make and we honor God's laws and God's dominion if you like over these spheres as a way of love and worship of God as a way of of living to be able to come to the earth and share those truths with people is something that we deeply desire and we hope that at some time in the future when more than just a couple of people have faith in those things. It is only then that we will be able to manifest physically. This issue of faith and faith in God's love and God's laws and God's power and yes, even God's dominion over the sphere that you live in. When enough people have faith in this, then we will be able to manifest ourselves physically and to be able to speak openly and freely about where we have come from and what we desire for the earth. Just as we are attempting to do in a somewhat very limited way through the medium in front of you. Rachel, I was wondering whether you could explain a bit about the law involved as to why that's not possible now. There are many restrictions placed upon us, um, all pertaining to the issues of love. And as many of you may or may not be aware, God's understanding of love and the, um, the way in which love should be, um, the, the way in which his laws uphold the possibilities for love and limit the possibilities for the growth of error are very precise. And it is these kinds of laws that govern everything, but there are very particular laws governing our ability to come to earth 
when the um, conditions are not right in terms of if the conditions are such that error will only be spread by us manifesting, then the laws immediately restrict that because each of God's laws, whether you are aware of this or not, are all there to limit the growth of error and to stimulate or encourage the growth of love. And it is this very particular issue that... um, this is what upholds all of God's laws, but this is really what we would wish to say about our ability to come here. Unless there are conditions that are conducive to the growth of love and faith, then we are limited to, be, to being here in such a tangible sense because the opposite would be true. We, our presence here would actually lead to, um, to more error and more misunderstanding. And God's laws are not designed to support such actions. So the question then becomes, why is it that there are certain spirits who are on the natural love path who seem to be able to do, or or seem to want to do those things? Well, there are two reasons for this. One is that they they do not honour God's laws as we do. And they also are... um, need a moment to overcome the intellectual resistance. These spirits do not honour the law in the way that we do, but also their power is not as great as ours is in this physical plane. And while it may seem to that may seem to be a contradictory um, statement, in that they seem to manifest quite a bit of power in the, in the way that they appear, they do not. This is this is the um, the the uh, great difference in the power of what we would manifest in coming to the physical physical plane as we exist now in the celestial heavens. That our presence is far stronger, far more. Uh, it has far more of an impact than those in lower spheres are able to do. So, those, so it's probably right to say that those in the lower spheres, when they come here, they don't appear to be much different than the average human, whereas if you came here, you would appear to be like either an angel or, a, or some kind of strange... Uh, um, bright being from outer space that somebody would misinterpret. Yes, and uh, we also are trying to convey that it is not just the the physical presence that mm-hmm. has an impact, but the spiritual presence. The, because of the level of love from God which we have received, um, our our physical manifest, manifestation is imbued, or it it. Um, so much love comes out of it that this is in very, very stark contrast to the way, the the conditions upon the earth at this time. Mm -hmm. And the effects of such a presence are, well, quite profound. Well, it would create a lot of fear and terror. Trigger Mm -hmm. much Mm -hmm. error within the the environment. Mm -hmm. Um, Or uh, as... As you are aware, brother, each step that you take towards God and the more of God's love that you receive, the more error is confronted in your environment. Mm. So if we were to multiply our brother's very um, very good condition in love now... Very limited condition. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the perspective of seeing it in comparison with the others in the room and there, there is some quite marked difference but um, <laughs> but we understand but understand as well that each each sphere that we move through each each um, progression towards God is not a simple um, uh, linear progression it is exponential and so each sphere that we enter the love especially beyond the eighth sphere the love that is within us is exponentially greater and so for us now, Timothy and I reside in between the ninth and 10th sphere to come here at this time. It is a huge presence of love. And, and also the two of us <laughs> appearing in such a, um, 
an instantaneous way would cause ripple effects. In fact, if we were to do it here in this room, the ripple effects of us manifesting at this time would be felt globally in terms of the error that would be um, triggered by the presence of that love. And so we are restricted. Of course, those same ripple effects will happen once one of the 14 becomes at one with God. Um, but the difference is that we've lived among people on earth and, uh, and therefore have the ability to teach. There are also laws based around what you can share. So a spirit from the higher spheres can materialise a body and help someone individually, but they, they are restricted from sharing God's truth in that position, if that makes sense. And this is, this is that which we were referring to earlier. This limitation is only um, lifted when enough people on earth have faith. So faith has the um, effect of opening the heart to, towards God and towards new truth. And so when enough people on the planet have a, a certain level of faith, this would enable us to come and share more of God's truths because the overall... Um, environment would be one that is more open to receiving these truths and not entering states of fear or um, hatred in response to what we, we present. So basically, the 14 came to sort of bash the path down <laughs> and then hopefully by the time that's been done, there'll be quite a lot of people who've, uh, uh, open and having enough faith but also open to truth so that whenever our celestial friends do appear on earth that uh, there is not a large amount of violent opposition to their appearance. There is much beauty in everything that God designs and even indeed this process that our very humble brothers and sisters of the 14 have undertaken. Um, there, is, there is definite um, there is a definite design inherent in the process that, the process that they are going through. Each of them at times feels very frustrated about their, um, their, the speed of their progress and what, it, what they have seemingly lost and what it seems that they must overcome in order to regain what their condition and their relationship with God. And yet this is... This is while very painful and um, requiring a great deal of will and desire on their part, this, this process is actually designed to make things easier for each of you in that it is a gradual change that you are able to observe and it is being well documented as well. But it is a gradual change that you are able to observe and the confrontation becomes increasingly, 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 increasingly more um, severe in terms of the contrast between error and truth, between fear and love. But you have this opportunity to open gradually as they change gradually. And this is wonderful because if you choose this, at the time when they reach at one moment with God, you will be in a state where you are able to be almost that intermediary for others where the contrast between fear and love and error and truth is not so profound as to devastate a person. So even though our, our, well, our brothers here in the room who are often feeling uh, at times, why did we do this? <laughs> um, they, what they are engaged in requires such a deep level of humility in order to continue and um, to grow in this way. But God has designed it in such a way that it is actually very um, loving towards those others on earth. Now, rather than you ask another personal question, perhaps why don't we ask Rachel and Tim a personal question? Does that sound? Because quite often we, we're a bit selfish when we engage our spirit friends and we're not, we want to know a bit more about them. So um, are there things you'd like to share, Tim and Rachel, or 
Shall I ask the questions? <laughs> you know that we are not shy. <laughs> we are happy to share with you. And um, we, we feel so strongly, we are very happy to share about our life here um, in the spirit world or the lives that we led on earth. But we feel the, the most joy that we have is being, and this is what we say to Miriam often, is simply allowing our presence to be felt uh, here with others. This feels uh, such a, a great way that we wish to share. We wish to share this love that we have and this um, encouragement that we wish to give to each of you in this very, very worthwhile endeavour that you are um, attempting to undertake, that you are taking your first steps on. And so for us, this is a lovely way to share, to be able to be present with you and and to hopefully convey some of that deep um, regard we have for each of you. For we know you have many choices in life, and to choose this path um, is not always easy. So how would you describe your personality? Because there's people in the room who can't feel your personality, so how would you describe it? We are a soul who is very, um, for both Tim and I, uh, in our lives on earth, we felt strongly drawn towards, towards God in, uh, and towards service. And this is perhaps two of the, the divine, some of the strongest um, traits in our personality that defined our life on earth and, and continue to define us here in the spirit world. We have um, a strong feeling for God and desire to know God and to be known by God. Um, but also we, we both, well, we are not yet in the union state and so I'm speaking of us as, as two, although often we do forget ourselves and recognise that we are one. Um, but this, this desire to serve uh, has been something that we did, both of us, on earth and have continued to do in the spirit world. We, we helped you, brother, and Miriam very much um, to, to assist people in lower realms in the spirit world. And also, um, when this opportunity arrived to become guides for Miriam, we we felt deeply honoured. Um, but it was very fitting that God would um, desire this for us because our desire for service is such a, such a strong one. We feel, we, uh, we feel quite alive when we are able to um, assist others, especially in their relationship with God and to, to come to know the very um, big possibilities that are available in this relationship with God. In fact, our, our nature is um, quite similar to uh, some of the qualities that Mary, Mary uh, displayed in her early life, uh, in, this, in this life. We both have enjoyed travelling on earth, but also in the spirit world. We, we spent much time exploring after we became at one with God, we spent much time exploring. We were fascinated by, for example, the many different worlds that are and different realities almost that people in the six dimensions are attempting to create. And the very many different ways, um, different groups within um, the second and third spheres choose to interpret their religious faith. We spent much time exploring these things and interacting with these people. We have a feeling um, of joy when we come to, to meet different people and to see them and understand why they do certain things. So um, this is why it was also chosen for us to to be quite suitable for Miriam again in her early earth life when she reincarnated because many of these things were within her, the family that she chose to return to and it made it easy for us to connect with her and to guide her in ways that would eventually lead her to this realisation of who she is. Mm. And Mi Miriam mentioned earlier that you were 
in the tenth sphere. Is that actually true? It is perhaps her underplaying our conditions. Correct, somewhat. yes. <laughs> so that's the little filter of Mary's there. Yes, this is a. Again, don't be laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, Miriam often receives the the more accurate um, message first, which she she chooses to question. We are in fact in the tw the thirteenth sphere, between the twelfth and thirteenth sphere. Mm -hmm. And um, you lived on Earth, obviously, at the time of the first century after Jesus and Mary? Yes, we knew them. We mm. knew you <laughs> mm. um, during this time. And, um, and for, for Tim, he was more closely associated with yourself, as you know. Mm. And um, after my passing, which happened um, not long after your passing, uh, some, not even a year after your passing, I, I passed and understand that Miriam has shared that in the last couple of days about how that occurred. Um, but Tim went on to spend much time teaching divine truth on earth mm. until his So is he the Timothy of the Bible that Paul wrote to? Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. We knew each other in our time on earth and we had a brief love. But circumstances and the culture of the time meant that we did not pursue this. Mm. I felt strongly that my role was to be with Miriam. I wished to serve. And um, the injuries surrounding the lack of... We did not give much regard to this soulmate relationship. Mm. And so while Tim and I met briefly and felt a deep love for each other um, in, a, in the brief months that we knew each other, it, we both felt that we had different roles that we needed to fulfil. His was um, in teaching divine truth, in, in sharing that on the, on the earth. And I felt strongly that my way of assisting um, the way to continue was to, to be by Miriam's side. And so we parted without much thought for our own personal happiness. Mm. And this is something that both of us have had to work through since our passing this injury, while our soul has a strong feeling for service, there was the, the injury within both of us to deny ourselves in favour of service. Mm. Now we have a much more loving viewpoint of what it is to serve and, and if, uh, consequently much happier. And, and this brought us together much more quickly after Timothy's passing. I had already begun to work through this injury as, as I entered, uh, some years after I entered the spirit world, Tim joined me much later, 30 years later. And um, at that time, he still was needing to work through that injury and I was able to assist him with that. Mm. And after, after this happened, we were able to prioritise our love much more firmly and we progressed. As you know, this relationship between soulmates is a wonderful way to... Um, to encourage the progression of the total soul because one half pulls upon the other and as, as you come into to closer rapport again, the desires um, that are more open perhaps in one half of the soul than in the other begin another tug forward. And, and this has happened for us quite beautifully throughout our progression. Mm, and many probably on earth don't understand this aspect of once you honour the love in your relationship, that actually causes you to be able to have more ability to fulfil your design, if you like, or God's design for you. Yeah. Yes, and isn't this a wonderful truth? And perhaps we need to uh, give you an entire message on this one beautiful truth at some time in the future because mm. it is very true. And both Timothy and I... Um, remember the feeling of receiving this truth from God of, that when we honour the love for our soul above service 
ab above, really the opposite, above denying ourselves in favour of others, there was much more energy and much more ability to serve. Mm. So much more ability to fulfil that passion that we had mm. once we healed the injuries surrounding it and once we honoured the love between the two halves of our, ourself. Mm. Yeah. It is... It is um, I see that in our audience. There's a lot of that same sort of focus where there's desire to help others before they help themselves. Yes. And that, uh, that is obviously going to severely restrict how you can help others. It certainly does. Even the most... Um, uh, what, what we perceived as the most pure desire that we had on earth to, to further the way this most profound thing that changed us changed us so profoundly. Um, for myself, I was born with a, with a deformity in the first century and um, my dear brother Jesus healed that for me. And so the, my faith and desire to share the truth about God and, and the way with others was so strong and I believed that this was such a pure desire to serve others. And yet it led to... Um, quite a lot of pain and separation from, from myself and from my soulmate. And um, it wasn't until I passed that I came to understand how important this was. This, to purify, this service was not really a pure desire, even though I thought it was the most pure thing that um, I had ever desired. And while it was a wonderful desire, um, until, I, until I really purified it in terms of love, and let go of the injury within it, it wasn't until then that I began to see the true power of that desire in action. And um, Tim and I have had an amazing life in the interim between then and now, serving and teaching the way, but in a way that did not cause more pain and suffering or separation between ourselves. And did you receive counsel from Jesus and Mary about the fact that you were separating yourselves uh, just to fulfil what was sort of almost like an addictive part of your desire? Certainly both of them spoke to us strongly about this. But as many of you would be accustomed to, we did not necessarily pay a, a great deal of attention to what they said. Because mm. it, it's something that Jesus and Mary felt quite strongly about, wasn't it? This yes. Whenever a soulmate couple met to honour the love that they had between each other. They spoke about this on and on, <laughs> in fact. And to be very honest, at that time for most of us, it was as if they were speaking almost in a different language to talk about the honouring of the love between men and women and not to honour the contract of the marriage between men and women. And many of us could not understand really what they meant. And um, it wasn't until really some time after my passing when I felt the devastation of what I had done in choosing to go, a sep or both Timothy and I choosing to separate, and um, the fact that even then I had passed, and this would mean a long separation uh, from him until he passed, that we began to see that it wasn't necessarily about the marriage contract that our culture honoured, but this love that I felt more intensely after my passing even, um, that we began to see what they were, what they were trying to teach us. Mm. And that would, for the sake of the audience, that would have been similar with most of the people back then that were listening to Jesus at the time? Yes, yes. Mm. Many of them were fascinated by the truths about God and fascinated by you personally because you, you um, displayed such love and such compassion and such faith, faith that people had not experienced before because we saw it in the way that you lived and acted and were willing to confront um, people in our society that we would never be willing to confront. So many of us were just fascinated by this. And, of course, we felt your love also. Um, but many of the teachings that you gave, we did not really um, begin to really consider and 
um, think about more personally what they really meant to us and what this issue of love and the relationship between men and women, many of us had no concept of why that would be even pertinent to a relationship with God. And for m the majority of us who knew you in that time, it wasn't until after our passing that we began to look more closely at the, the, the incredible breadth of the teachings that you had given us. Most of us in our time on earth simply focused on the love of God and telling people about the love of God. Well, I think Miriam's starting to get a bit tired now, so I'm going to let her have her rest. Thank you very much, Rachel and Tim, for coming. Thank you all for your... If we may leave you simply with some words of encouragement. Do not forget this very first part of the message that we gave to you, which is to simply begin to become aware of who it is you are right now, because this knowledge will empower you to make changes. And coming to know yourself and then desiring for, to share that with God, just as you are right now, this will form the basis of the changes that you are able to make in the coming year. And we have already made the date to come and speak with you again <laughs> next year. Um, we see a great deal of potential in, in many of you, in fact. And we, we see that this week has been time well spent, especially for a certain few of you. And so we encourage you as you leave here, because there will be all of your fears that are still unresolved and all of those addictions that are still in play in your life, there will be many spirits who will wish to come and to, to lead you away from dealing with those things. So if you can remember in the next few weeks that this is likely to occur and to remind yourself of the truths that you have learned and begun, some of you have begun to even feel some of these truths in the past week. If you are able to um, keep these things in mind and to, to simply pray to know yourselves well and to know your will well so that once you know it well, you might begin to change it in a real way, in an emotional way. Um, we see there is great potential and we, we truly thank you for this opportunity to come and speak with you this afternoon. Thanks very much. Good day. How are you all doing? Good. Um, we'll probably have a bit of a break now. Um, what's the time? 30. In fact, you probably have expended most of your energy for doing mediumship today. Haven't you? For mediumship, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah probably. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. I'm a bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> but it went okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, she's a very lovely lady, my guide. Yeah. Very special. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so for those who missed out on their personal questions, but I could feel Mary tiring, and I just wanted the opportunity at the end for you to get to know Rachel and Tim's life a bit, so you can feel a bit more connection with them. You know, like a lot of times we hear a lot of things from our spirit friends, but. You know, we don't get to connect to their life and what their life was like, and therefore, sometimes we think that that sort of where they are now is so far removed from our personal experience. And what I, the reason why I asked some of those pers more personal questions was because you can see that their personal experience was such that they did create a lot of uh, their own unhappiness through their choices. Mm -hmm. And this is why Rachel and Tim were so concerned about saying to you about it, really focusing on your desires and focusing on your choices you know what choices are you going to make because you you can make even after you leave here you can make choices that are negative or positive it's it's going to really depend on how you exercise your will and how much faith you have about the positive choices to where you're going to go and as you can see in their life sometimes you know they were given advice and given 
council to do certain things, but of course they felt their own priorities were better placed in a different direction, as we often do, right? When it's our own life, we think, oh, that's, you know, that sounds well and good for everyone else, but for me, mm. you know, I think I'll do this instead, and not understanding uh, the full impact. And sometimes we don't understand the full impact until we've lived out our life and realised that it's something we chose 30 years ago we're still dealing with today. So in, in, in Rachel's case, her desire to basically save Mary from a certain type of outcome sort of and her feeling that that was her way of serving mm. caused her to detune from this love this love of soulmate which is a so she was still connected with the love of god but it caused her to detune from this love of soulmate and and when it when that happened she made choices and so did timothy make choices which meant that they'd be separated for 30 for or 40 time. years longer than what they needed to be does that make sense and so then they only discovered that when they came back together, they could serve even better and it was far more yeah, powerful. Yeah, and then, of course, you imagine once they've discovered that, they felt the pain that the whole 40 years that they spent apart wasn't even necessary. Mm. And, and this is what we often do with our poor decisions, is that we, we make a decision in a certain direction thinking that it's the better decision, against generally against advice from more loving people your guides for example or sometimes we've given advice and we often go against that advice thinking that we know better for our life at times and and then as, in the end 30 or 40 years later I only discover that all of that pain that was created as a result of that decision or choice was almost completely unnecessary and this is one of the things I wanted to illustrate to you through our questioning of Rachel and Tim, in that they were just they they had as many failings as yourselves. They made choices that caused their own pain, you know, just like you do at times. And this is why they are so focused on trying to help you make decisions in harmony with love and truth and wanting you to connect with your real desires. And and in particular, some of the advice they gave, wanting you to connect with you as you are right now, because that will help you see what you know where the desires are lacking. Even does that make sense? And where the problems reside. And, and in other words, let yourself see if you desire to have a carefree life without your soulmate. Um, you know, let yourself see that's what you really, really, really want at this point in time rather than going oh I do want my soulmate you know let yourself see how why you want it let yourself feel why you want it let yourself feel what you know emotional injuries cause you to want that and things like that and when you do that you'll find that you'll make less choices and decisions that cause your own pain and unhappiness does that make sense so and I think there are, you know, there are many of our friends in the first century who we could bring to have a chat who could illustrate to you some of the choices that they made while they're on earth and how those choices, against all reason and logic and also against love, caused so much pain and suffering in their later life only to then have years and years later realise that they could have made a different choice right back at a certain point. Does that make sense? And the, the pain of regret that we have a tendency to experience, particularly most people after they pass in the spirit world, they generally have a lot of pain of regret. And, uh, and what we would like to encourage you to do is to avoid that by feeling who you are right now, working through these addictions and issues and connecting with your desires and passions and then honouring them. Don't, don't, don't let your fear take you away from them. Don't let your fear of other people take you away from them. Don't let your fear of, you know, the false beliefs you have about God, your fear of God take you away from them even because God wants you to engage them, not go away from them. And don't let your fears of what's going to happen to you if you do that take you away from them. Don't let your fear of things like being controlled or manipulated or attacked or any other of those kind of fears take you away from your desires because if you do that you will end up with making you will end up making choices and decisions that m sometimes a hundred years later you you come to regret and then you feel like the hundred years was wasted does that make sense and and 
the, the beauty is you don't need to waste time like that. We, none of us need to waste time like that. It gets back down to our choices as to why we waste time like that. It's, there's this common New Age philosophy is, oh, I needed to go through that in order to, and then put, fill in the blank, you know. Um, none of that is really true. We don't need to go through all of these really negative things to, to come to terms with it. Because we can choose right now to recognise love, recognise desire, recognise passion, recognise where we are. And we can do that now. We, we don't have to wait until some terrible event occurs to force us into that position. We don't have to engage one addiction to the, to, and forsake all of our desires to the engage one of those addictions. We're far better off you know, doing this in a more pure manner. And, uh, and the more you can engage that individually you'll find the less pain and suffering you'll have in your future progress. You, you'll find you'll have less uh, worries and concerns. And also, when you pass in the spirit world, you will have no regret. No regret. No. If you asked almost any spirit who's passed into the second sphere, what is their biggest emotion? Most of the time, the biggest emotion in the second sphere is regret. And the reason why is because they realise they could have made a different choice at, at so many times in their life and yet they made, a diff they made the choice that finished up harming their life further. And, and, you know, and when you're in the second sphere, you're coming to an emotional acknowledgement of all the truth of your life. And so, of course, in the second sphere, a lot of spirits feel that terrible emotion of regret. And what I'm saying, suggesting to you is you don't need to feel the emotion of regret much at all if you're willing to go through these you know learn these basic principles about desire love truth will faith and really focus your attention on those don't go into the sort of listening to the people who are in a darker space than yourself don't go into the devil's advocate roles and don't go into the roles of condescension again of you know just of of having an idealistic even an idealistic viewpoint of life don't condemn yourself for that. Allow yourself to engage your faith along those lines and what will happen is you'll finish up having a life with hardly any regrets. Yeah. And when you pass in the spirit world, you won't feel regret and so you won't spend years you know, having to come to terms with what happened because you've already come to terms with everything that happened. Yeah. So that's, and, that, and that's probably, you know, there's many of our friends in the first century who didn't listen to those, that kind of counsel and advice, who would love to come and talk to you about you know, what happened, what counsel and advice they received, and what they chose to do instead, and then what they saw as the consequence of what they chose to do that was out of harmony with the loving, you know, the loving pathway they could have taken. Rachel and Tim often give me that counsel, like that um, just one decision you know you, you've got a decision ahead of you like which way are you going to go because it can alter the course of your life and sometimes I think even in um, coming to feel about who I am and our relationship sometimes it's been one decision where I've just chosen a finally humility or I've chosen um to reach out instead of keep pushing you away or whatever it was, that's really gotten me to this point even. <laughs> and um, then the happiness that comes yes. from the reversal of these poor decisions that are often, that we often take because we've been basically um, conditioned and almost brainwashed by our society and our, our upbringing into taking these course of actions. Um, and just one choice and you reverse things and then you start experiencing the joy and then you realise, wow, I could have reversed this five years ago or ten years ago because I had, you know, there are certain events in your life that happened where somebody tried to make you conscious of that particular thing. You know, yesterday I was having a conversation with Caroline about um, her, her relationship with her husband and she's going through stuff now about, you know, getting removed from her church and, and, and the irony of it all is that that almost 15 years ago, her husband said that he didn't want to get involved as involved as he is now 
in the church and she wanted him to. <laughs> and if she had just listened to her husband at that time, she wouldn't now be dealing with the fact that he is involved in the church and she doesn't want to be. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> so it's just like... Um, these kind of things happen very regularly where years and years later we realise, wow, we just pushed somebody or we pushed ourselves into a certain course of action because of an addiction only to find out years and years later that it was just an addiction that we were unwilling to feel a certain emotion and if we had willing, been willing to feel that emotion, emotion we wouldn't be paying for the results of it today. right? Because remember the the, the pain that we're feeling is a lot about the compensation that we're paying for the previous choices we made. Most of the time, which we made out of harmony with love or out of, in harmony with our addictions. And, uh, and so this is why Rachel and Tim are very, very hot on this aspect of pursuing desire in harmony with love. You know, never give up your desires for any other reason that they are not loving you see the statement that I just made so never give up a desire unless you notice or know for sure that the desire is not loving then, then of course you need to give up that desire right but, but any desire that you, know, that you know is loving you need to pursue with all of your effort you need to put it aside many other things and pursue that thing with all of your effort because it will help you understand yourself It'll help you make decisions in harmony with love. It'll help you bring yourself in harmony with truth. It will help so many things. Mm. And then, then later, you'll look back and you go, ah, I'm so glad I made that decision. So glad that I made that choice then. You know, cause, and and there, um, we, like, we're often, we see many, you know, we've spoken to many tens of thousands of people right, over the last 10 years. And, and we see many of them making choices just one little choice that, that is going to lead them down a path of a lot of pain and potentially a lot of pain for hundreds of years just because they couldn't accept one piece of advice or one piece of counsel. You, know, and that, you don't want to do that, really. You, you, want to, you want to be very careful about doing that because your life is just... as a, as a lovely statement in one of the Robert James Lee's books, that just... Everything turns on a diamond point. You know, that's sometimes it's just the tiniest of choices that you make that lead to another choice that leads to another choice, leads to another choice. Just a tiny of choice, tiniest choice that you made in an addiction leads you to another choice with a bigger addiction, and so forth. And before you know it, you know, 25 years have passed, and then you realize, oh, all this pain has been caused by that. that process of making choice after choice after choice out of harmony with desire based in or, or, or founded or, or as a foundation of love for driving the desire so yeah we'd like to just encourage you to do that yeah. okay well do you want to... sorry babe, you... well what I was thinking of is we'd finish now